Hi, I'm Kevin Alcuni, adult librarian in the Exploration and Creativity Department of the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm uh, Steve Orozco, the library assistant in the Exploration and Creativity Department. And welcome to today's LA May program, Gila Gets a Restaurant with LA Taco. Before we begin, we'd first we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA May programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. Boom, right there. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Yep. Steve's nailing it. Our website has blog posts, video links, and all other kinds of fun things that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs, including our fabulous Libros Book Festival happening on September 24th and 25th. It's a free bilingual book festival for the whole family. Check our online calendar for more details. Yeah, and uh, on to today's event, Gela gets a restaurant, LA Taco, with Bricia Lopez and Javier Cabral. Uh, Bricia was born and raised in Mitla, Oaxaca. Uh, founded by her father in 1994, Gela Getza is a uh, Oaxacan restaurant that has become a temple to Oaxacan food and tradition in LA and the US. She is a partner in Gela Getza and spearheads all operations with her siblings. Alongside her sister, she is the co-creator for the podcast, Super Mamas. And she is also the co-founder of I Love Micheladas. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Javier Cabral was born in East Hollywood and raised in the streets of uh, East LA in the San Gabriel Valley. As a teenager, he started, uh, he started one of the first food blogs in Los Angeles, Teenage Gluster. At 16, he published his first paid article about Mexican American holiday food traditions. And in 2012, he became an official restaurant scout for the late Jonathan Gold. His writing has been featured in over a dozen publications and he is currently the editor in chief of LA Taco. Today, these two will talk about the importance of uh, Oaxacan-owned mezcal, women-led restaurants, taco intersectionality, mole, and of course, the best spots to eat and drink in Oaxaca and LA. Uh, but before we bring on our two guests, we're gonna be showing a short video produced by the LA Times with camera work by Yadira Flores and Cody Long. And it was also edited by Cody Long. Here we go. All right. When we moved to the U.S. in 94, like we lived in a room. So because of that, we were so close together all the time. That compounded with the fact that like when you're from Oaxaca, you kind of have a chip on your shoulder about like just people looking down on you in Mexico, you know, like so you come here and you have that. This place that's almost um, outgrowth of that room, right? That room is now the restaurant. We come and we hang out, we're here all the time together. And then that chip on our shoulder about like our Oaxacanness and our identity, because now the restaurant's a hub for that. We have to maintain our unity and our identity as you know Oaxacans in LA, in that duality of cultures. You know, because because now we're like putting our own stamp on this. I think we were giving a choice, and we made the conscious decision to say yes. This is going to be our life mission. This is going to be your career. This is going to be, and it is. It, we love where we come from. We love, we love to talk about our culture. Yeah. We love to feed people our food. There's nothing better than to change someone's perception of an entire culture. And to be able to do that is such a privilege. Every time I, I, we invite people to the restaurant, it's like inviting them to our living room, to our, to our dining room. Yeah. Like, I love having people over at my house for dinner. And I wish I could have all of LA over but I can have them over here. It was the way that Jonathan Gold wrote about Gelegetza. It was the way that he understood, because it wasn't even, it wasn't written from a way of, a very archeological way yeah. of like these people, right? It was from a sense of just authenticity, love, and respect. Yeah. And... <clears throat> well, like oneness, where it's like yeah. E equality. Yeah, equality. It wasn't as these people are doing this. It was, I've just experienced this. And I think that that opened 
a lot of people's eyes into what was Mexican food, what is Mexican food, right? And explore, explorations of regions. And then to kind of see again this juxtaposition of a Korean building serving a very regional Mexican food, not just like Mexican, right? It's Oaxacan in Koreatown in a very traditional in Korean building. What does that mean, right? If you're not from LA, you are just a little bit taken back, but this is LA. This is what Los Angeles is. The way a culture sees a food is how it sees, it's a reflection of how it sees those people. So like the fact that he saw our food was like a reflection of how he saw us. So they grasp, they have something to grasp on. They have to say, I'm so proud of being like this because I have great food, because I have a great language, because I have a great art, because my culture has great music, because I have a beautiful city where I come from. Like yeah. all those things kind of, it just sort of, it's, it's an effect that, yeah. that happens. It's like saying I have worth. <laughs> I, I could never let down my parents, I could never let down Jonathan Gold, and I could never let down Los Angeles because this is needed. This is needed not only for this city, but it's needed for this country. To know that a, fam a small family restaurant serving very regional Mexican food can survive for so long, I think it's hope for the rest of the industry. Such a cool video. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I also wanted to mention before we bring on our two guests uh, that yeah. if you'd like a free copy of uh, the book that Bricia and Javier uh, wrote, Oaxaca, Home Cooking from the Heart of Mexico, please email, uh, oh, Steve's got it, the EC department <laughs> at LAPL.org for a free copy. I'm not good at pointing. Okay, yeah, let's bring on our main guest. No one wants to hear us anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Hey, okay. what's up? We're, we're gonna go now. Yeah. Yeah, how you guys doing? Great. I wanted to see if Javier cried after watching uh, the video. I was gonna I was gonna say I have a it's a it's a mix of emotions. It's like craving and clay that really intensely and also a little bit like crying. But I think that's uh that's Oaxaca, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll we'll let you guys get to it. We'll we'll see you on the back end. Thank you so much for the incredible, like, welcome. Oh my gosh. Um, how are you, Javi? Good. How are you? Um, it's a lovely afternoon. How are, how, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm in Oaxaca and I was just listening to that video and I thought what a perfect way to start to have a conversation and we can speak about Jonathan Gold and how he was such an important part of both of our lives. Cause I feel that he was in my life ever since I was, I don't know, like 12 or 10. Um, and then he was in your life when you were just a teenager, but you reading him and how mm -hmm. his spirit brought us together to know each other, meet each other. And then he was a catapult to us writing this book. So uh, maybe we can start talking about how you first heard about Jonathan Gold. Yeah. Um... Man, it's so crazy, right? I mean, even just thinking about it, it's, it goes deep. Um, so I, I, I first started reading Jonathan Gold when I was, uh, I don't know, maybe like 13 or 14, um, whatever whatever age you are when you're in ninth, ninth and 10th grade. Because um, I would read uh, LA Weekly, which is the publication where I used to work at for a long time. Right. Um, and I would, I would read it for punk show. I would read it to see where the local punk shows were happening. And then I, you know, I, I would have a long bus ride home back to East LA. And uh, I started reading his reviews, um, and then I was like, "Man, like, if the, I want to. I kind of like like how crazy it is it to be paid to to eat, um, to write about food, and and he's he's kind of like the the you know the biggest reason um, that you know I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, so that's I really owe like pretty much like everything to. So him. he basically showed uh, you like what was possible, right? Like this is possible to do. 
Well, yeah, and also, you know, it, you you got to think back. You know, this is like this is this is what what year was this? this is like two thousand like eight or nine, right? Or yeah, like right, I think more or less. And the he so you know, I had my my food blog, and he credited me in a in a in a restaurant review. So in a printed publication, he's like, oh, I first read about this restaurant on the on Javier Cabral's blog, the Teenage Gluster, which is this is like what back did he, then, wait, right? Hold on, one second. So did he say Javier Cabral's blog, or did he say like in this blog, in the Teenage Gluster's blog, or did he say your uh, name? He said my name and the Teenage Gluster. Yeah, um, he said both. So again, this is like this is back then before before crediting was cool before before uh you know before it was it was demanded before it was like this is just someone who, of like a noble heart who like you know wrote a you know created content created a story or i mean went for a, a restaurant review and he found out about it and he like posted full attribution of like oh i first heard about this restaurant on the, mm -hmm. the teenage luster food blog you know this is in 2008 seven nine um one of those three years so it's think about you know what the, the kind of person he was right that like he definitely did not have to do that um so that's that's how i first met him how how, how are you i mean i'm sure your memories is is, a, is maybe uh similar or in, in a in a um oh, well i was very well before i keep going with my story i'm gonna open these doors and maybe it'll help with the echo because i can hear myself back and it's like a little freaky milk is the echo okay is yeah it sounds good it, it, it sounds good here it sounds good here okay good um Gosh, so I think the first time I, like he impacted my life was always the first time he wrote about the restaurant, which was in in the mid nineties. And I remember like that first influx of people to the restaurant, right? And then I remember, well, I remember him telling me that he would always see me in the corner doing my homework. But I think at that time, like I didn't know who he was. I really didn't know sort of the impact that he had and what in what he like meant at that moment to the food landscape of LA. Mm -hmm. But I think like my earliest memory of him or kind of like the one moment that stands out is the, is the day that he introduced because he introduced us because believe it or not, I still remember what I was wearing and I still remember the wow. first time I met you. Like I remember where it was, it was in Culver City. It was at the yep. Taste of the Nation food event. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to do like a mole thing on stage and he, I spoke to him and he was telling me, I need you. I want you to meet. Oh, I invited him to a new restaurant that had just opened. And he said, you have to meet um, Javier. I feel like he would probably get out there before I do. Um, but mm -hmm. I feel like you guys should like know each other. And we met each other. And I think this is at a moment when, I mean, for all those of you who don't understand, like, the way food media works today this was in the beginning of the blog i don't even know what it, the blog area i guess right yeah this this was this was before i think yelp was just barely starting to get tra traction instagram wasn't around yet yeah um, instagram wasn't around twitter you, was really where you would find yeah friends. twitter it, it was obviously facebook was around and everybody was updating their status every so often and you know checking people's timeline was you know a thing um so that's when i met javier and javier had a food blog the teenage gluster and he went to my restaurant and him and i just we just became friends like and it my gosh it's been years i think maybe a decade since you and i have been you know friends and you know life happened and we just you know our relationship evolved um and then uh, our book agent, uh, Jonas Strauss came to the restaurant once and told me, you know, I spoke to Jonathan Gold and he, you know, he, um, he told me I should like meet you. So that was like another moment in my life where he really, um, I feel like he was, he moved in my life in so many ways that I really didn't know. And, um, I met him and it took us, it took me a like, few years for me to actually pull the trigger and say, I I think I'm ready to write a book. And then when I thought about who we would write it with, it was like Javier. And at that moment, you had just left the job that now allowed you to be able to write books. Um, and it was your first book and it was my first book. And we, I moved to Oaxaca for a month. You came for a couple of weeks and we were just eating in my mom's kitchen for two weeks straight. You were talking to my, you were drinking mezcal with my dad late at night, getting stories from the family. Uh, we would go everywhere in Oaxaca together. And then Oaxaca cookbook came to be, um, originally 
the forward was supposed to be by uh, Jonathan Gold. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't around by the time the book published, was, which was really difficult for you and I. And I think he was such a monumental part of our lives, of our careers, of just our friendship. And I feel like he, he has this this ever like this ever glowing soul that will continue to live in everyone's work and in, in in LA. So the video that everyone saw in the beginning was the video that was produced by LA Times when my family and I received the um, the gold award. And to be honest, it was I I, I really I, it's hard for me to even talk. I think this is the first time when I can speak of Jonathan Gold where I'm not. You know, I mean, I do still get emotional, but I think I've learned to kind of control my emotions now. Uh, but I remember when we received the award, it was a super emotional day for everybody. Everybody was crying. And, you know, he just meant so much to the city and to food. And it's hard to now live in a life where he's not around. And even last year, through everything that happened with the restaurant industry in Los Angeles, I think in everyone's mind and everyone would always speak and I would say like, I, I wonder what would Jonathan say about this right now? Or I wonder what he would be doing right now, you know? Um, but I think he did so much. And I think the things that he did are still like, re people are still sort of living in that life. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, it's a, uh, you're right. That, that, that moment, that, that moment in which, in which Jonathan Gold, you know, he introduced us and, um, even then, you know, again, he he gave me like a restaurant spot, right? Like he could have written about himself, but he was like, no, here's here's Brisa. You'll probably get there um, in the beginning, and and sure, and you know, and and sure enough, here we are now. Like what, like like twelve years later. Um, but yeah, with Oaxaca, you know, it, it was it was uh, if anyone out there believes in serendipity or destiny, it was definitely that uh, because I worked for a a, a company that um, I couldn't write books, and literally it was the day after um that 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 this deal happened with Brisa and i and and it was um it was uh i mean i i mean it was no words it's i mean it, it, it's to this day one of my you know best achievements and um you know that i've i've had uh, the honor of sharing with you know because as a writer it's always about the 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 family and the subject right and in this case i was lucky enough that to have known the Lopez family, and I mean, I don't know, but he said kind of adopted me, right? A little bit, a long time ago. Um, so it's, it's. Uh, I, I would say, you really. I mean, we, what, we, we would joke about, right, my Bricia? Like, uh, I would have to like channel my inner Bricia when you know, like, what would Bricia think? What would like, you know, everything, you know? So it's. Um, well, number book one, writing... I feel like if you do not want to know what I think. Let's just put that out there. Nobody really wants to live in this brain. Trust me. But yes, you know, you've known me enough where I trusted you to like to get my voice across. Right. And even things that you would send over, I was like, yeah, but that's not the way I would say it, though. You know, so I think like in time, like you're, you've gone to the point where I can say things and you know exactly how to beautify them in a very authentic form where it doesn't hide my voice, you know? Yeah, and and you know, I think the the word is conversational, right? Conversational, but but clear and direct. And that was one thing, you know, is one of the topics in this conversation is Oaxaca, California, right? And and you know, to be able to write recipes, um, and you know, write it for an audience in the U.S., but still keep it like one hundred with you know Oaxacan sazon and flavor, um, you know, that was something that with with each recipe we 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 both. We both said, we we decided that that we were gonna. I mean, do you want to talk about like you know your philosophy your philosophy with masa and why you didn't want to use instant corn flour? Well, I think it's I think in this point, number one, we wrote this book what like I think it's been already four years that we actually wrote it. Yes, yeah, Can't right? believe it. It's, it feels uh, like it feels like just last year. Seriously. Yeah, just because it once you write it, it takes another year for it to for photos and pictures so it, from the moment you'd write it it even takes a year and a half for it to actually come to life um although i think you and i were in a very specific uh, sort of situation because we wrote it and it came out i think a year after i think most people write it and then it's like a year and a half or two years but um you and i just get shit done uh so <laughs> I think from, and this is again, in the time when really nobody was saying, 
my okay i think i gotta start from the beginning i know like my mind was like 100 miles an hour so i gotta slow down when my dad started the restaurant in 94 he wanted to make a restaurant that was going to serve his people his community his 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 own right he wanted to feed the oaxacan community food from oaxaca and he always said you cannot cheat a oaxacan from their food like they will know when things are not like legit so from the very beginning we always you know made our own masa from scratch we always brought clayudas from oaxaca we always brought like these like, chiles from oaxaca there are certain flavors that you just simply cannot replicate so one of the things that totally irks me and just kind of like makes me cringe is when I go to another place and they, I see on the menu like clayuda and then they give you a down tostada and I'm like, why don't you just name it tostada? Like, why do you have to go and use a name like clayuda, right? Well, it's because they just want to like, they just, they're appropriating something that doesn't belong to them. And if it doesn't belong to you, totally cool. You can serve it, but pay its respect. So for us, it, I, I'm from Oaxaca, so for me, it's like live water corn, right? Like corn is like really like up there. I think we, our diet is a corn-based diet, atole, tortillas, pozole, trejate. I mean, you can go on, memela, you can go on and on about how important corn is in our diet. So. I, you cannot like give me a tortilla from Maseca and expect someone from Oaxaca to say like that's a good tortilla, right? Because and you can I'm in Oaxaca right now actually, so you can go to Oaxaca, you can go to any corner like in the street, and they you just order tortilla with salt and in a, in a like tortilla sal y salsa like that's your dinner and that will be the ultimate. My mouth is even watering. My mouth is watering talking about tortilla with sal. Okay, that's how great this is. So. I didn't know bad tortillas until I moved to LA. That's the moment I realized like Damn. food could be bad. Real talk. Real it's talk. Re it's I, mean, real. I mean, I was tiny yeah, yeah. eleven and like I was like, this is not tortilla. So, you know, when, it, when we talk about the book, we, we just we wanted to make sure that we and in the restaurant we wanted to get my life across, right? And like what it means to me. So for me, if you're watching right now and you know of a place that serves that like tells you you're getting a clayuda, but you're not getting a real clayuda, like you should call them out because it's not right. <laughs> and it, it, it just irks me because they use the word Oaxaca like if it was like yeah. in a very disrespectful way. And, and then for me, my whole mission is to, for people to just, of course, like there's so much to love about this place, but there's all with that love has to come admiration or respect above anything else. Yeah, and just for some for some background, some background histories and background notes for everyone out there, um, the first uh, the first uh, domesticated corn um, is believed to have been found. Like the first remnants of it is actually uh, close to to La Colula region. So the reason why you know Oaxaca, you know, um, they've been fiercely opposed to GMO corn. They've been opposed to to you know to instant corn flour to maseca. You know, in, in Oaxaca is the kind of place where you're walking and like Lisa said, any clayuda stand, it's going to be made with like heirloom Oaxacan corn, but before it was called heirloom Oaxacan corn, when it was just amazing, right. beautiful, toasty, like, you know, like an experience when you just take a bite of this tortilla, of this clayuda. So you have to like take that into account, you know, when you go into Oaxaca and, 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 and remember that because, you know, especially in the U.S., we're living in a, you know, we live in a very capitalist Kind of country and and everything is marketed to us right so we see code words like oaxacan heirloom corn from you know and there's like photos of like you know you know wrinkled farm like like farmers with wrinkled faces and selling it to you and it justifies like the high cost of the maize which i i understand that's a business but in oaxaca that's just the way it is because that's just the way it's been so you know with maize maize is one of those topics that you know you can only you, you, you can only talk about it for so long before it gets um you know very emotional and or controversial and political because right. it's that strong um you know and, then, and that being said Oaxaca in general i feel like anything that comes from Oaxaca gets politicized real quick and like just like there's controversial because that's just the way Oaxaca works dude like that's just you can talk about cheese you can talk about mezcal you can talk about corn you can talk about you can talk about anything that comes to Oaxaca and it would always be that um just because we're an indigenous city and 
you know, we, and, right. and because we're so like, como arraigados, like to our culture. You know, I had a, a talk with a friend yeah. the other day and he said, I'm just, you know, I'm just concerned about Oaxaca becoming like Tulum. And I said, well, I, mean, I just, I don't, I really don't think that will happen because our people, like people from Oaxaca are so like, if we were able to stop McDonald's from coming into downtown Oaxaca, we can totally stop people from coming and, be, you know, becoming the same. I think that <laughs> like at, at the end of the day, it has to be with like the people that live here and there's two, I mean, there'll be a battle before something like that happens, right? A bloqueo somewhere. So I, I, I'm not concerned. Um, and I, I, I think people should definitely come and live Oaxaca and enjoy and see and learn because I think it, it grows the admiration for the Mexican culture. I think that coming here to Oaxaca puts Mexico in a, in a different sort of level of admiration when it comes to food. It helps people understand the why and it brings a lot of value to who we are as people. I think that a lot of people still to this day is 2021 when we're hosting this program. So future, uh, you know, future generations, if you're watching this in some sort of, you know, time <laughs> lap, you know, yes, there was time where people thought Mexican food should be cheap. Shocker. But I think in the future that won't happen. And I think it happened. And the way that would happen is people coming to places like these and understanding the value. Um, and I think coming here to Oaxaca, it, it just really helps with everything else. Yeah, I, you know, again, more background, you know, in, you know, your father would, because, you know, food is such an integral part of Oaxaca, especially if you move to the U.S. and if you're Oaxacan, you know, mm -hmm. your father um, first started off like going door to door knocking and selling quesillo and clayudas and mezcal. You know, this is how important it is. There's an underground network in LA of, of you know, of like pungent, you know, strong tasting quesillo. There's clayudas from Oaxaca, and this is all like this is all like an, an informal economy from you know immigrants who you know, if you're Oaxacan in LA, like there's no chance in hell that you're gonna like eat like a a a, a tortilla of not of not the best quality, and also uh, uh, you know cheese that's that tastes more like rubber than real cheese. So, and that's still to this day, I mean, you can take a walk on like, on like Irolo Street and, uh, and 8th, right? Um, what is that? No, 7th, right? What street is that, Bricia? Where, where the, where Galegas like, first started? I was reading the Irolo. comments and I missed that question. What? <laughs> no worries. No, where, where is the, the, you know, like I'm saying, so to this day, you, you can walk on, uh, on, on Irolo Street and 8th Street, right? 8th or street. where 8th Street and you'll still, on a weekend morning, you'll see like, you know, in, indigenous vendors from Oaxaca who are selling like, you know, a pipiche or there's or they're they're yeah, you know, and in all, Rolo too, all in Irolo. Like if you if you drive yeah. in Irolo, which is the street in LA, like you'll find like barbershop and their name is Oaxaca Barbershop or Abarrotes Oaxaca or Mercado Oaxaca. So um, there is definitely a huge community um, here in LA. I was gonna say they're in LA, but that's because I'm not in LA right now. But um, in Los Angeles, a huge Oaxaca community. And we're just so, I think like as time goes on, like the prouder that we become of our background as indigenous people. I think like mm -hmm. if you saw the video in the beginning, you, uh, we mentioned a little bit about that, about how we are so discriminated against in our own country. I mean, I was way more discriminated when I lived in Mexico than when I lived in LA. Um, and like I've never felt, I like, in LA, I think I found a community that really championed my food and championed my culture. And in Mexico, like all I heard was like that I was this type of person that didn't really be more than something, right? Because I come from Oaxaca. But I think that's definitely changing. I think the landscape's changing. I think that it just makes me so happy when I when I when I come to Oaxaca and I visit different places and I see the young generation just like championing their food, championing their clothing, championing their language uh, without feeling like I need to leave. Like I need to move, I need to migrate, I need to do other than what my parents do. I see so many young people, you know, getting into sanias and getting into the craft. Like I went to see an alfarero or earlier today um, who is a blind clay maker, does incredible art and his kids are in the business and, you know, I, I think like that's how you make a community grow, right? So um, it, it just makes me really, really happy. And that's like the work that I like to do. I like to champion who I am. I champion my culture. And I think about my daughter. I think about my son. Um, 
And I just want to make sure that every, and, and I think about other little brown girls growing up today who didn't have anyone to look to. And I, you know, I had a conversation with also the chief and editor of Vogue Mexico, you know, and like the importance of putting people like Yelita Paricio on the cover or championing, you know, Oaxacan models, right? So I think like that's so important. And I, and I see so much change happening and I'm just excited for the future. Since since we're on the topic of, of you know Oaxac and pride, um, let's get your uh, your raw thoughts on mezcal. Oh, I don't know, man. Where do we start? I'm telling you, everything everything when it comes to Oaxaca, everything has to get politicized. You have to pick a side. You have to understand. But when you talk about mezcal, like what do you mean? Because it's such a huge subject. So I don't know where you want to go with this conversation. Okay, let's let's First let's off, narrow. I want to say, I don't own a mezcal brand, number one. I just want to make sure I say that because a lot of people think that I own a mezcal brand. I do not. I am not in a mezcal business in any way, shape, or form, but go. <laughs> well, okay, so let's start with that. Why? I mean, you know, people would probably assume they're like, hey, like, you know, Bricia, like, do you, like, you know, why don't you, what's, like, why don't you make a Galaguetza mezcal? Why, why don't you own a mezcal brand? So I don't own a mezcal brand, and I, I made a decision a long time ago um, because I didn't want to be in a brand business. For me, it's all about championing mezcal as a category, and I felt like if I was got to get involved with the brand, I would steer away from mezcal in general, and I would because I know like that's how business works, right? Um, and mm -hmm. I would just be like all about the brand. And I think my, my mind would be a little bit more tainted and like the way, you know, making money. I, I mean, it's just, I didn't think I was ready to be in a situation where I wanted to be in a mezcal business. Instead, I wanted to champion every brand and I want to champion mezcal as a, as a category, right? Um, which I, I, which I think would was like maybe a wrong way of thinking because I think you definitely can. Like now, I, 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 now I realize that you definitely can have a brand and champion other brands and grow the category as a whole. Today, I think that I'm just not interested in being in the business because I think that has gone to the point where it's becoming too, almost like what did you call it one time? Like, oh my gosh, it was like. Everybody's looking for like, I don't know, like almost a little like sacrilegious in a way. Like you have to like say a specific story and everybody wants to see like the farmer and like, you know, everyone has to see like a poor person for them to feel like, oh, I'm doing great. Like I'm helping someone like by drinking my stuff. I don't know. It, it's, it's becoming a, a, a place where I, I feel like a lot is happening and a lot of changing right now. Uh, and, and I think I'd rather be part of being able to talk about the importance of of supporting Oaxacan-owned brands, uh, brown-owned brands, brands owned by women, uh, and 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 I feel like that's where my my where my energy can be channeled the best. Being in the position I am today, in in Galagetza, for example, I've curated, I've changed my entire perception of the like the collection that I carry. Before I used to care about carrying the most brands possible. Anyone that would come with me with a mezcal, I'd buy it. I didn't care where it came from. I didn't care who owned it. I didn't care anything. I just wanted to have like the biggest collection. Uh, today is completely different. I say no to so many brands. And they have, you know, and, and the brands that I do welcome into my restaurant um, have to meet one of the four categories that we have, it has to be number one, owned by someone from Oaxaca, owned by, you know, Latino owned, Mexican owned. Um, it has to be owned by women more than 51% or number four, um, that the producer who makes a mezcal is some way, shape or form associated in the ownership structure. Um, and I think that's very important because a lot of brands come to me and they give me the same story and i i told you and i've told many people in public um i'm not afraid to say it's like they come with me with the same story right i was like in oaxaca and like 
I fell in love and like I found this place off the road, the beaten path. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I really need to get this to the world. And like, I need to help these people. And like, oh, my brand helps this community by buying mezcal. Like, no, like that's not enough for me. I think for me, it's like, is the producer, like very simple, is the producer involved in the ownership structure? Not only are you buying mm -hmm. from them, but are you including them in the profits of the business? Because if that's not happening, like I'm not interested because I know of a lot of producers that have their own brands or work with other brands that do. So think what makes you so different? And I feel like Miska has gone to the point where it, the same story is the story is like the same story happening across the board that unless you meet those requirements, I'm just not interested in being part of your, you know, of, of supporting your business. Here. which is uh it's you know that's very really commendable it's really hard to do as a business owner so perhaps i think because we're running out of time we're going to go into questions soon um let's go into the next big topic that everyone i'm sure is dying to hear um let's hear your top five like must eat and drink locations as soon as you arrive to Oaxaca. no i think people want to hear your favorite taco locations i think before people want to hear my go-to i think like the next big topic is where do people come to LA and have tacos? I met someone yesterday from Los Angeles and they were just saying how in LA they couldn't find great Mexican food. So, I mean, I just Damn. wanted to like, just, I, I, I like wanted to turn around and like, walk away because his uh -huh. friend were from New York. And like, how are you going to talk like this about LA when your homies yeah. are from New York who are right here? So, um, I just want to make sure that we get the right, right off the bat. If you're if you're traveling within the U.S. and you're looking for Mexican food, there is no other place in the U.S. where you go aside from Los Angeles. We have the best Mexican food in the country. So, Javier, where can people have incredible? Like, where can they go for a great taco experience? So, uh, you know, that's the, that exact, so answering that for me, that's a life question. You know, answering that is, is, is the reason why I get up in the morning and work with LA Taco. So LA Taco, um, if, if everyone's not aware, we're, we're, a we're a news culture and taco alternative, uh, uh news source in LA, uh, that started since, since 2006. Um, we recently repivoted and are a news first pl platform, but are we united by tacos we cracked the secret to, to supporting journalism by um offering free tacos and free drinks and free discounts to our members who support us every month and you get like an LA taco card now it's an app that we just created and you go around uh, like for example like Gelaguetza, you get a free michelada upgrade if you are if you are an la taco member um if you go to holbosch in mercado olympic in downtown you get two free oysters uh when you are an la taco member um, and you know, so on and so on. Our, our list is a 60 strong. So anyways, to answer that question, I would say, I mean, aside from Gelaguetz, obviously, um, that doesn't count. Um, you know, but I would um, say if you only, if you only have one restaurant to go to and for like a layover or something in LA, definitely, you know, catch a, an Uber or Lyft to Gelaguetz and just take it all in. Cause that's about as LA as it gets. And it, it's about as delicious as it gets. If you wanted to go I on a talk. Mole. With, com, by the way. Uh, can we I get someone to drop? Can we say someone to drop on the comments right here? I love mole.com, please. Thank you very much. All right, go. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, so if uh, uh, if you were only in LA for a limited amount of time and you wanted to maximize your taco consumption and get to understand our city's taco life, uh, I would drive straight through. Uh, we call it Olymp. Uh, uh, we call it a Olympic Taco Row, Olympic, which is on Olympic Boulevard between Soto and like Lorena. Um, so just pay, drop, drop a pin on Marisco Jalisco. Um, and there is a, a very intense concentration of regional taco styles in this part. So you can walk to all of them. So you start at, at Marisco Jalisco, which is, a, I mean, arguably LA's best daytime taco. It's a crispy shrimp taco that you can just eat so many of them because they're so refreshing and, and like are so savory and delicious. Um, and then you can walk over to Tacos de Vire La Unica. And have like a you know like a nice uh, a taco de the 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 birria that's kind of dorado and, and really crispy and with the, with goat that's not too gamey. You can walk across the street, have a, a burrito a burrito um, a Zacateca style burrito um, with like hand, with the with, with with really thin flour tortillas with birria and frijoles. Uh, is that my burritos La Palma? Exactly, burritos La Palma. Dude, I eat burritos um, La Palma. I think like twice a week. 
Yeah, they're 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 very easy to, to eat many of them because they're so petite. They're petite burritos, you know. So it's I like eat them, if everyone... I eat them twice a week. Like I eat a lot of burritos. <laughs> And uh, and then across from that, there's another uh, another taquero that does uh, uh, tacos de canasta. So you know you can knock like four or five regional style within like a two hour radius if you go out in the in daytime. At nighttime, I would look at, I would look out for uh, Los Dorados LA. They make a flautas de de borrego. They actually also set up at Smorgasburg now. Um, and they are or, or flautas de papa, so crispy potato tacos that are delicious. The the, the dude actually married into LA taco royalty. Um, he uh, married into the King Taco family, so he has a lot of like those salsas and flauta, on his flautas. He makes his, his tortillas really thin, so they absorb very little oil. I am really so crispy. hungry right now. That's and, where I'm uh, going to go. I'm going to go to the taco spot in Oaxaca for dinner. I was trying to figure out where to go for dinner. I'm going to have to. Oaxaca only has one yeah. taco spot. Only one. The rest that's another, suck. We're that's not another a, panel. We're not a taco culture. That's another panel. Yeah, that, that, it, Oaxaca not is not a taco, taco culture. culture. So, you know, that being said, if Oaxaca is not a taco culture, what kind of culture is it? And where can they go taste these things in Oaxaca? Because I'm sure people are going to go to Oaxaca after this and they want to have to write things down. I mean, I'll start are off. Are you talking about... Say... Go. What? No, no. I'll start. I mean, I'm I just... I mean, the, the mich... I mean, oh my, in Mexico, you get bit by everything there. Um, it, so the, the michelada that changed my life is um, the michelada that, uh, you know, which is that La Giralda which I'm sure I'll let you talk about it, but I still think about the Michelada and I wish I can drink it here in LA. La Giralda was a place that actually inspired, what do you mean? You can have it like it's a, um, La Giralda was a place that inspired our Michelada brand. So um, my siblings and I also launched, um, we've launched other businesses ever, uh, since we took over my parents' restaurant, one of them being our Michelada mix, which is um, I love micheladas.com where you can buy a mix, a pre-made mix that you just sort of pour in your beer and you have a michelada in seconds. Uh, we are fans and obsessed. We obsess over micheladas and just that's always been an essence and like a staple in our restaurant. Um, it all started here in Oaxaca. My cousins actually owned um, a botanero back in the day um and uh, that's really like where like this infatuation with uh, michelada has begun and la giralda is another place that i another botanero that i genuinely love and adore take all my friends to where you basically sit down and the more you eat the more you drink the more food they bring you so you don't pay for the food you just pay for the beer and they just feed you little antojitos um, and every botanero, like this botanero culture is basically when you get to the sixth beer is when you get like your seafood uh, dish, right? And when you see someone with like eating like a, a pescado frito or some sort of like fish dish, that's when you know like, oh, they're drinking, like, oh, yeah. you're drinking. Um, but they have an incredible michelada. Um, I will say if you go, if you're staying in Oaxaca, um, you know, kind of like there's always like the iconic places that you can go with like great chefs, like. Um, you know, El Origen, what the focus that uh, Caseñanos was like, I think for me, the best chef in Oaxaca. You have Alejandro Ruiz, also another one of the best chefs in, in, in Mexico, Casa Oaxaca. But I will say that last night I went to this place I am now obsessing over. Um, the place is called Levadura de Olla. And the chef, her name is Talia. She's from La Mexica. Um, and I will tell you that it's very... So I'm a food snob. I'm a Oaxaca food snob. I truly believe that Galaguetza has the best Oaxacan food. And I always pride myself with telling people, if, when you eat in Galaguetza, it will be as great, if not better, than some places you will eat here in Oaxaca. And like, I've always been kind of shy about saying that, but now I'm kind of owning it because I've heard it from so many people and I stand by my, stand by my food that, you know, like that hardcore. But I will say that last night, this woman's food just like up the ante of what like the of like what Oaxacan food is. I mean, her food wow. is incredible, and I think it's just a, like a matter of time before you know these critics get there and name it like the best restaurant in the world. The dishes that I had there are dishes I've never had before, and just completely like blew my mind, and I understood. That there's a lot more for me to learn about Oaxacan cooking and I always and again when it comes to Oaxacan food um, and you've heard it here I mean you can eat something very different every single day of the year that you come um, because there's so many regions and there's so much food um, you know usually like my sort of level of food exploration is very much stated in the valley of Oaxaca 
um, she's from La Mixteca and she's been in this in business for I think two years, a year and a half, yeah, two years. Um, but let me tell you, Javi, like she just upped the ante. what um is and the experience it could be um i don't see javi anymore i just see myself it's been 45 minutes though uh and i think we are ready to come in with some comments questions um i know that we're gonna feed some to us yeah we're um, gonna bring yes. them on oh go ahead steve <laughs> yeah we yeah, we can pop them up uh sorry okay. i guess we lost javi um i'm gonna turn my cam on so you're just not talking to you so it's uh, fine <laughs> <laughs> i talk to myself all the time come right? on steve oh okay all right, All right. and then so then I the, start. There you go. Can you read that, okay. or do you want me to read it to you? Fitness, fitness gains, fitness gains. Oh, okay. okay. I like to be fit too. I do I like to work good. out. Have you thought of expanding to an? Hello, oh, there's Javi. He's back. <laughs> um, have you thought about expansion or location? So, we thought about opening other. Uh, other concepts. I was super close of opening a new restaurant a couple of years ago. Um, I think right now uh, the focus of our family is expanding our our retail business. So we actually ship mole all over um, all over the country. You can go to ilovemolestore.com for those of you who don't live in LA. We ship our mole paste, we ship our michelada mix. Um, or Michelada Mix um, has, um, thankfully, has gotten some distribution here in Los Angeles. You can find it in uh, Latino grocery stores like Vallarta, Northgate, now Food Fest. Uh, and um, right now, I'm actually in Oaxaca. We're finishing a few places that we'd love to bring people and host people here in Oaxaca in our home. So I think for me, um, Javi and I are writing a second book. So I think for, for me, writing a sec, uh, starting a, a second location when it comes to Galagetza, it's not something that it's a priority right now, but I learned in life, never say never, and who knows, you know? And, and, you, all, and you all heard it here first. We haven't actually broke the news yet. So you all, you all are, are the first, if you tuned in here, if you tuned in, thank you so much for, your, your, for listening and for tuning in. And yes, we are, Felicia and I are writing another cookbook together and it's really exciting, so. Second question. Ooh, this is a good one. Bricia, take it away. <laughs> Can my Jimenez Sandoval, how do you feel thoughts about all these celebrities having tequila brands? Do you think it will come after Mezcal? So look, another sort of sort of epiphany I've had in my life is this. El derecho al respeto ajeno es la paz. That's something that my homie Benito Juarez from Oaxaca, my paisano said. And hold I'm on, learning on, on. to just- Let, Let's try that into English, please. Let's try. El derecho, el respeto al derecho el respeto. ajeno es la paz, uh, a.k.a. the way that I translate it is this, no te metas con mi cucuyo, no te meto con el tuyo. Like, basically, like, <laughs> everyone has their own business and, like, their privacy is their, like, the, like their, their private decisions are their decisions and, like, let them be, right? Um, so, I, like, my sort of, like, philosophy in life changes like I get older. So like, how do I feel? I mean, I think like, let them, you know, you're doing you, you do you. I think like tequila has gone to the point. I mean, I think that a lot of celebrities sort of saw the potential of like what tequila can still be and it still can be um, after George Clooney exited a billion dollar company, right? Uh, and after that, it was like, whoa, like you can do that with tequila. Um, but I think 100% they will be coming after Mezcal just because I think the tequila world is becoming very boring. And it's like, how do you break through all the noise is by story. And Oaxaca has everything, has story, has culture, everything. Um, I think there's still a lot of space for people to do things the right way, the things I was saying it right, I, including, well, I would do a celebrity comp, but also include um, the producer and some sort of ownership structure, right? Or partnering with other people. And, um, you know, really when people say like helping a community, like actually putting their, their money where their mouth is. And I think like, because our community is so loud, I think there still can't, there's still space and there's still opportunity for people to do that in the Mescal world. So um, as long as people do it right and do it well, I think it can be exciting. Um, but you know, I can, I'm, I'm one person, all I can do is make decisions like in my restaurant. Right. So for me, unless they meet the four requirements I spoke about earlier, like I wouldn't welcome that brand into my restaurant and I wouldn't drink it as a consumer. Uh, 
Okay, Tomas Romero said, I'm curious about Brisa's comment about the perception that Mexican food is cheap. Can you talk more about that from a historical perspective? Well, I think that, you know, from for a very long time, and I hear that, I mean, that's like one of the comments that I get the most um, in platforms like Google reviews, Yelp. It's like, everything was wonderful. The food was great. Service was awesome. One of the one, like, it's like, it was amazing, but I had to wait one star it's like well you know i can't help like there's a pandemic happening still you know um but the second one is the food was incredible i feel like it was a little bit too expensive for mexican but great um and i think i did put up uh i did put a post on my instagram and i said like what is too expensive for mexican even mean right i think it just means um, food racism and the perception that because it comes from people that are from Mexico, it should be cheaper. And, but I think that like really like flows over so many other things like textiles, pottery, if it's made in Oaxaca by someone from Oaxaca, like it should be cheaper. Like, I don't want to pay this much. Right. Or like, it blows my mind to like, when people call, like come to the restaurant and they're like, but why is the mezcal so expensive? And in Oaxaca is like, I can have this for way less. And it's like, well, then you should get on a plane, right? Make the expense of buying a plane ticket, traveling, make the expense of staying up in Oaxaca and like renting a hotel room. If you can find one nowadays, because everything is booked, driving out to the place, eating, get yourself into a plane, and fly back to Oaxaca and you tell me if that's cheaper for you. So I feel like this perception that like, things should be cheaper because they're like, it, 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 I think it's something that I'm, I constantly fight every single day. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Javi, in terms of history. Yeah, so I can I can speak to it about in, in regards here in, in California or in LA. Um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, just the... Uh, the nostalgia of, ta uh, of tacos in LA, right? Like this used to be like $1 taco land. So, you know, there's a lot of double standards that exist, you know, within ourselves. You know, it's the same reason why we all don't mind to go on a date night to go to like a nice Italian restaurant and drop like over a hundred bucks on like pasta and wine, which is, you know, just flour and sauce. But then you trip if you go have like a, a nice, you know, like scallop taco with uni or something like that. You know, why is that when it's like in reality, um, nixtamal masa is like actually harder to make than, I mean, it's, it's, it's equally as hard to make as pasta or it's, you know, it's, it's also really elaborate. So a lot of it has to do with it, with nostalgia and just getting over what you, what you uh, associate with here in, in LA. And also people, people have like an issue with like fancy tacos. They're like, they, they think that like uh, tacos should be like, you know, like only eaten like, you know, at, outside of like, you know, in a street stand somewhere. Which are delicious for too. Don't get don't get us wrong, <laughs> but you know, for a dollar. But you know, so a, a lot of the times they'll have like, oh, like why am I going to go to like a, you know to this restaurant where I can go like two blocks away and have a taco for for like for two bucks, and they kind of they're all like they get all uppity about it. So it's a lot of times it's it's a lot of uh, I mean real talk like a lot of lack of common sense, um, and uh, and also a double standard that exists uh, within ourselves. I actually uh, if if anyone is is really interested in diving into this topic, I broke it all down in the story that's being linked right now. I wrote a, a, a really long feature where I interviewed a lot of, of chefs and um, and you know and kind of get their 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 take. But if there's one thing to take away from this conversation is remember that there is a taco for every mood and for every uh, for every time of the day. So going out for like a date night taco and having some nice drinks with it is super awesome. And that's a very different occasion than you know going out for tacos for some greasy tacos after to, to sober you up after drinking. Those two can exist side by side next to each other. They do not have to be one or the other. Preach sister, I mean, brother, <laughs> <laughs> Rosalina Mesa. Saludos, I have a question of aesthetics. Any input info about the aesthetics of Hakan restaurants? Like they look so beautiful, like I am in my grandmother's Adobe kitchen. Um, are you looking for, I'm, I'm a little, Like, I don't really understand that question, but I'm, is your question about like my opinion? I think can we can add it up again. Yeah, I think we can, I think we can elaborate. I'm a little confused. 
I think. Uh, oh, do you have any info on this? Text? Okay, I will say this. Um, I think that um, a lot of young architects are starting to like sort of come up in Oaxaca. I think also, like I spoke earlier, there's a younger generation of artesanos coming up, and I think they have their own sort of idea and style. Um, and and it, it, for me, it's super exciting to see when I come to Oaxaca and I see how everything's just coming back to tradition. I think that, I mean, there was like a, definitely a period of like Oaxaca went through like modernism. Um, but I think like right now, everyone's sort of like, I want my kitchen to look like just like my grandma's because that's the way I grew up. And like, that's the work I want to put up today. Um, so I've seen a lot of that. And in Oaxaca, when you come, and I think that's why people love coming to Oaxaca and you see Oaxaca all over TikTok and Instagram, because you could literally like turn around and there's just beautifulness everywhere. And I think just all this, this young blood that's sort of growing up here and like boiling here it's just they they and it's so green and so many plants and, and just traditional traditional elements are having a great comeback ever thought of pop-ups or a food truck in 2022 oh fitness gains really wants me to go on the road um no i haven't really thought of pop-ups and food trip pops of uh, food trucks in 2022 but you can always order our products on i love <laughs> um i don't i think that's it for questions um yeah if you guys just have any final thoughts I don't have any thoughts. I just want to thank you so much to the library, to LA, Ellie and me for bringing this together. I hope everyone enjoyed our conversation. Um, it seems like you did because you don't have many questions, which is awesome and great. Um, you can always find me on Instagram at Lisa Lopez. You can come to the restaurant. I would love to meet you, say hi, um, grab a copy of our book, uh, Oaxaca, home from the heart of Mexico, Mexico. Um, and yeah, we're just so excited. And thank you so much for having us. And you have no idea what it means to have platforms like these to speak on, um, you know, the truth, our truth as, you know, someone who is native from Oaxaca and someone who's like native Angelino Mexican, like Javier. Yeah, and I have one final thought. I think, you know, just, you know, as you, as you get inspired to travel to Oaxaca and book a ticket, you know, just remember to to be, to definitely enjoy it and enjoy um, you know everything that Oaxaca has to be has to offer. Is definitely is um, the powerhouse or one of the powerhouses in, in all of Mexico for food, drinks, culture. But also just remember like the history of, of it and and just the people that have made it what what it is. Um, and I'm and I'm speaking you know as myself you know because I'm not Oaxaqueño and I. But every time I, I go to Oaxaca, I always, you know, I always think about these things because they're important in the way that that, that you enjoy things and the way that you post about it on Instagram or social media. You know, it's not. So it gets a little deep. So, um, especially Oaxaca, I think the word that Brisa was looking for earlier with mezcal was like spiritual. It's like innately a very spiritual place, um, and you will feel that around with the food and with the drinks. But um, you know, that's something that. Uh, you can you can enjoy uh, without having it be uh, you know without wanting to sell it yourself. <laughs> Greatly put, Javier. Steve is muted. Sorry about that. I came on a little too early and I got anxious. Uh, it was a great program. Thank you very much, uh, you two. Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, yeah, we'd love uh, love to you know maybe have you back for another program sometime that'd be awesome anytime yeah. <laughs> all right thank you so much yes yes bye see you everyone. Oh, thank you oh. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead all right all right thank you very much for joining us today on LA, uh, today's LMA program remember to check out the library's calendar of events at lapl.org slash events including uh, the Libros Festival on Friday, September 24th. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Friday, September 24th, and, sat and Saturday, September 25th, uh, which will offer you two days of entertainment of, uh, for all ages, featuring Spanish language and bilingual storytelling, performances, workshops, and award-winning authors. Also, please check out amazing programs on Thursday, September 23rd, when LA Made welcomes astronaut Dr. Jose Hernandez, who will talk about the challenges he faced as part of a migrant farm working family and the path he chose to become a member of the ninth class of uh, NASA astronauts. And then lastly, thank you for watching today's program. 
LA Made only works because of viewers like you. So thank you very much and have a most excellent day. Thank you.